Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We're delighted to speak today with our good friend, uh, Sam Bahor, Palestinian businessman, entrepreneur, and commentator, uh, co-founder with Ed Thompson of the Americans for a Vibrant Palestinian Economy. So Sam, uh, welcome, it's good to see you. Um, uh, before you jump into your presentation, um, uh, how are you doing? How's your family doing? I know you have a number of friends here. So just give us a brief update about how, you, how you're doing and your health and just how you're doing during this time. Thank you very much, Michael. It's uh, great to be here with you all. Uh, last time we were together, I was in Fort Wayne and had, we were just talking before the launch of the Zoom call that we were at the Sweetwater Musical Place, which was amazing that I keep talking about. Um, so it's, it's good to be back even though the times that we're back talking are not the best of times by any stretch of the imagination, no matter where we go. Uh, personal wise, I'm doing fine. Uh, very, very long days with a lot of frustration in terms of what's going on. Uh, two daughters in the US, both stuck in Cambridge, one working from home and one studying at Harvard from home. And uh, me and my wife stay in touch with them online uh, every day, uh, but we're okay personally. And we're just trying to work out through COVID and annexation and George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and uh, climate change and uh, that's about it for now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not much going on in your life, I understand. <laughs> well, same, same with us here. The, this We're living in dystopian times is how I put it, but uh, uh, with all of that, it's good to have all of you friends with us on Zoom and Sam, welcome. Normally we just jump right into questions, but with the upcoming planned Israeli annexation of significant parts of the West Bank uh, looming on the horizon, Sam, I know you have a, uh, I know you have a presentation for us. So why don't we just turn it over to you for this presentation, and then we'll follow up with questions and the rest of the interview. Okay, sound okay with you? That's fine. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have a Go brief ahead. presentation to share with you all. Let me know if the screen, full screen is uh, showing. It is. Okay, great. Um, again, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I will go through this framing of annexation that we're finding ourselves facing in the next couple of days here. I've called my presentation another Israeli annexation for a reason. Uh, and I call this one the version 2020 because uh, many people, I think, believe this is the first time that Israel has uh, annexed Palestinian land. It's not. Uh, yet this specific annexation in 2020 has a different meaning, and I'll get to that in a second. So what I would like to start with is putting things in a broader frame. Uh, and I want to start with a point that is in the Charter of the United Nations, which was invoked in 1945. And it just gives us a starting point to keep our minds focused on what we're talking about in terms of annexation. The Charter of the United Nations says in section 2.4, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner just in case people don't think Palestine is a full state uh, because it is a non-member observer state that is inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So there is an overarching body of principle uh, that kind of regulates our thinking in terms of what annexation is uh, and allows us to understand is it legal or is it not. What is the annexation that we're talking about today? Well, in, in simple words, it's annexation is the acquisition of territory by force. And as I noted, uh, this is not the first act of Israeli annexation. I can go back before 1967, but in the 1967 Six Day War, uh, we have very well documented cases. Uh, the one which is 
shocking when you read the details is the Moroccan quarter inside the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, and that was a quarter which today is called the Western Wall Plaza. It was a, a housing quarter, uh, which was basically 10 days into the Six Day War, uh, brought down on the head of one of the residents because she couldn't leave in time. So you're talking about a track record. Actually, in 1967 as well, there were three very well-known villages in the Latrone area, which is on the green line uh, of Beit Nuba, Yalo, and Emwas. These are three villages that were basically told to evacuate and Israel deep, what they call depopulated those villages and then destroyed them. Um, and there's a lot that can be found online about that. Point meaning here is that Israeli annexation comes in a lot of different flavors. War is one way that they have justified uh, annexation. The other means has been through planning. And again, I can give a whole talk about just this issue of planning, but I'll point to one significant one, which is a plan, it's called the Alone Plan, uh, which basically is an Israeli plan from 1967, 1968, uh, which proposed to annex half of the West Bank, the entire Jordan Valley, plus some. Sound familiar? Israel has been at this for a very long time. And uh, what makes it different today, I guess, is that they have a window of opportunity of having Trump in office uh, and they're getting gifts that they never dreamt about, but they definitely had plans on the books trying to make them happen. Another mode of operation that Israel uses to annex is law. And here, the primary case is uh, in 1967, there was de facto annexation of East Jerusalem. And in 1980, in the Israeli Knesset, they actually legalized in an Israeli framing, uh, the total annexation of East Jerusalem. Uh, in 2017, we found that the Trump administration recognized that act of annexation, that act of illegal annexation. Interestingly, in 1980, when it was actually done, uh, the US actually, with the rest of the Security Council, passed a resolution uh, which condemned that and made sure that no state moves its capital to East Jerusalem. Uh, so Trump has walked away from longstanding US policy that has been there for a reason. And lastly, I would note here another mode of operation for uh, advancing annexation is the act of military occupation. And we see that, which is ongoing, as most of you know, uh, through many different tools. The settlement enterprise being the largest, taking land, moving their civilian population into these uh, caged military fortresses inside the West Bank, um, and basically then say uh, basically that that is Israeli territory. Um, and we go on with the separation wall, the barrier, uh, which was basically a land grab. It took 10% or more of the West Bank uh, under the premise of security, but now we're finding out it's not security at all. Then they tried to pass some retroactive laws legalizing settlements because even they knew that what they were doing was illegal. And they passed the law, I'll get to in a second in more detail, saying that those settlements that were created in the past can be legalized retroactively. Uh, that was actually uh, discounted recently by the Israeli Supreme Court. And then they've reoriented their court system of the cases that arise, the legal cases that arise under occupation. Uh, there used to be a specific process to get that legislated, uh, uh, judicated, I'm sorry, uh, either through the Ministry of Defense, which is responsible for the occupied territory, the Israeli Ministry of Defense, or to the Israeli Supreme Court directly. More recently, Israel has, I would call it gerrymandered the legal system and said many cases that used to go through that old route will now just go through the route of the Jerusalem District Court. Again, it's an indication that they have annexed or they're viewing it as this part and parcel of Israeli territory. And I would claim there is no sane person uh, that would claim that an act of annexation is legal. And I say that because we can disagree about the politics and who was right and who was wrong and what should happen in the future. But annexation per se, when done by a state, is blatantly a violation of international law. On the right hand side here, I put up a map. It's actually a map from one of the departments of the Palestine Liberation Organization, 
It's called the Negotiations Affairs Department, NAD, sometimes called Negotiations Support Unit. And this is a map that they produced back in January 2016. They were following what was happening because Israel was not shy, as I noted, from back since 1967 in the Alone Plan of what they desired in terms of annexing land. And the Jordan Valley has always been a strategic target for that Israeli planning. And if you see here, the yellow part in the bottom center is where the Palestinian population is. And all the other colors are different descriptions that Israel uses, but it's all annexation. Whether they call it a settlement or nature reserves or whatever, it's means that they use to be able to take land under different names. So this is, again, nothing new for the Palestinians in terms of an act of annexation. So did annexation wake you up? If so, I would say you haven't been paying attention with all due respect. Annexation and or creeping annexation, as I noted previously, is an ongoing Israeli theme. They have not deviated from that theme from day one. And uh, the most recent boldest example is the basic law addition uh, that Israel passed a law called the nation state law, the land of Israel is mentioned in that nation state law. And it basically says that uh, the right to self-determination inside Israel is only exclusively for the Jewish people. And when they say land of Israel, it's known to be from the river to the sea, if not even further than that. So they've actually incorporated uh, the policy of annexation within their basic law, which is the equivalent to the US Constitution. And that other uh, Knesset amendment that I spoke about uh, was in July 26, 2018, where they started shifting cases to go directly to the Israeli court system instead of giving Palestinians recourse through the military uh, control mechanisms that are in place. And then the last one is what I mentioned in terms of retroactively making settlements legal. They passed that in February 6, 2017. Only last month, uh, the, uh, earlier this month, I'm sorry, June 9th, the Supreme Court in Israel revoked that law. They couldn't even absorb it themselves. And a lot of times Israel uses this tactic. They'll pass a law, of course, based on law, facts on the ground get created, and then they'll revoke that illegal law later on. But reversing the facts on the ground may take forever to happen. Uh, and these are all just examples of annexation or creeping annexation that we should have all been aware of if we're following this issue. Palestinians, as I said, were not surprised at all. And you probably know what I'm about to list, but when you take 72 years of dispossession, creation of a refugee community, 72 years of structural discrimination of Palestinian Christians and Muslims inside Israel, 18 years of martial law that happened from 48 to 66 inside Israel against the Palestinian population, and 53 years of military occupation, which I am under today, living in Ramallah. Uh, a, a, an illegal settlement enterprise that houses today about 700,000 people, Israeli citizens. And this is a settlement enterprise that is supported, funded, served by the, US, by the uh, uh, Israeli government. Uh, so this is not, a, the settlements are not about good Israelis and bad Israelis. This is a state project. And they're basically using their citizens as pawns, moving them into and putting them in danger's way, uh, moving them into the West Bank. And then we have the separation barrier. The wall was created and deemed illegal by the International Court of Justice. We have 700 plus UN, UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, 700 plus. Um, so this is not a, a tangent discussion. This is a key part of the discourse of international law for a very, very long time. Again, nothing hidden here. This is all known components of this conflict. The latest UN Security Council resolution that the Obama administration abstained on to allow it to pass was resolution 2334, which is a significant one because it calls on states to differentiate how it deals with Israel. You can deal with Israel, the US claimed and the UN claimed, but you should not be dealing with Israel when it comes from the occupied territory, because that is an illegal presence, whether it's buying settlement products or dealing with the settlers themselves. 
We have 43 U.S. vetoes in the U.N., which have saved Israel from diplomatic accountability. Uh, that's significant and something we should keep in mind. We have 26 years of the Oslo Accords, which has been called the peace process, which hasn't, doesn't have much peace in it, uh, which allowed, as we were talking peace, it allowed Israel to expand its settler population by five times. So that should also give a clear indication of what Israel's intention was even throughout the peace process. And need I say more, I mean, daily humiliation, death, destruction, economic strain, all, all of this has been well documented. So it did not surprise us uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So very briefly, this round of annexation, what's the implication? The implication here, as I noted, it's not the act of annexation per se, it is what annexation means in 2020. I would say that it means, if we accept it, that might is right in politics. And that's something which is very problematic because if might is right and you're the stronger party today, you win. But I can practice might is right as well and try to become more violent so my might becomes more than your might and then you lose. That's a never ending game. Um, also, this round of annexation, given we're coming out of 25 years of a negotiation process, which has been dead for a couple years now, it's a clear indication that the Israelis have dismissed the ability to understand that this conflict must be ended through a negotiated solution. Um, and they basically are using Trump's presence to say, negotiations is done with, we are going to impose on the Palestinians a solution. And it's also a, a clear Israeli attempt, and I say attempt here because that's a larger discussion for maybe a different day, to kill the two-state solution. Interesting, it's the US and the international community that sold the Palestinians on accepting two states, Israel and Palestine, as a way out of this conflict. And as we finally started to get traction on the state of Palestine, the game changes. And all of a sudden, the whole discussion, and Trump said this the first couple weeks in office, one state, two states, whatever the parties want, knowing very well that one of the parties has a military force on the ground and has the power to impose a lot. Uh, so two states is about to be lost in the global sense. I actually think the Palestinians will continue to maintain uh, their commitment to their own state. And maybe most important, that this act of annexation in this late hour in the game of military occupation is condemning another generation of Israeli and Palestinians to perpetual conflict. This is not going to end anything, just the opposite. It may, it, it may have already opened up the Pandora's box, not only to speak of annexation, but to go to the core of the matter, which is Israeli military occupation. And if we wanna to go to the core of the core of the matter, we'll start talking about what happened in 1948 and link it all together because it's all linked. Second, the impact of this annexation, again, it's hard to say because we don't know the extent that Israel is about to have to do. I actually think the extent is not gonna happen totally on the 1st of July. Uh, I assume knowing how Israel operates that the annexation will not be on a day, it will be in a process like it has been for the last 73 years. And we'll probably be talking about this round of annexation maybe for another decade or so, because Israel puts things like this, which have a lot of international condemnation, on the slow burner. They take acts, but small acts that get them to the point where they want to be in order not to disrupt the boat too, too much. I actually think they're mistaken here. I think they disrupted the boat and they rocked the boat already to the point where they may have uh, blinked if we want to say this was a showdown between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The first act, no matter what the extent is, because the threat is already there, the coalition government that came together in Israel basically launched the process of annexation because it was a written document between Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu, that these two parties, which basically said, annexation is a political agenda item in our joint program. And that's why the Palestinians took the stance on that day, saying for us, annexation is already happening. The threat of it is enough. 
because in past episodes, we continued to wait until it actually happened on the ground. And at that point, it was too late. Today, we're saying, and I think it's working, that we're taking a strong position after Israel identified formally and in writing that they're heading towards annexation in an attempt to stop it before it happens. The first thing that will happen and is happening today is the loss of hope. The loss of hope to me is the most significant because you have an entire generation of Palestinians that have grown up in the Oslo process. We call them the Oslo generation. They don't know life as free people. They know life only within the walls and the settlement barriers that Israel has created around us. They only know how to go to point B or A, A, A to B uh, through checkpoints. And that loss of hope that this is going to be resolved peacefully is being uh, marked today by all different kinds of things, including individual acts of violence, but also people trying to get out, which is detrimental for Palestinians because ultimately Israel does everything it does to get Palestinians to leave. Very briefly, there's other impacts that can be talked about. Not all of them are negative. On the political front, this may increase the possibility for internal reconciliation in the Palestinian political body to come together. As we all know, the Palestinians have been divided politically uh, uh, for almost 15 years now. Uh, this annexation is bringing the parties closer together because now they have a collective program that they can work on, which is annexation. It's also calling for that Oslo generation to move away from thinking about two states and you find more and more calls of Palestinians saying, okay, Israel wants one state, let them have one state between the river and the sea, but that means we want full rights in that state. Basically converting this from a, a statehood struggle for national independence to a civil rights struggle which will look a lot like what's happening in the US streets these days. Also, uh, and I, I, I call for this as well, that politically, uh, we recognize the state of Israel to start the process of Oslo. So it was the Palestinians that took that first step in the Oslo peace process by recognizing in writing the state of Israel. Well, after 25 years, five times more settlers, and now with annexation around the corner again, it's time for the Palestinians to say, we revoke that recognition. That's a, a concession that we gave in good faith, hoping that Israel would recognize the state of Palestine. They never did. And Netanyahu just said two weeks ago that he never will. So if they don't wanna recognize the state of Palestine, there's no need for the Palestinians to have a one-sided recognition. On the economic side, and that's where I work every day, uh, the financial and business feasibility here is being threatened. Add to that COVID and it's being threatened times 10. Uh, so the annexation with COVID and uh, the failure of the peace process uh, we're facing in the business community, uh, the World Bank said 11% decrease in our economy this year. That's major, that's significant. Um, when we were looking at a 2% increase last year, hoping this year would bring us a 2% increase. If annexation happens in the Jordan Valley, it means the Palestinians would have lost their breadbasket. The Jordan Valley is the most fertile piece of land in the West Bank. It actually serves not only the Palestinian food market, uh, uh, but it also exports um, everything from dates to herbs and so forth. So it's a, it's a hard hit to our agricultural sector and our food supply. Of course, Israel is talking about annexing half of what was called Area C. Area C is a classification in the Oslo Accords. It means 62% of the West Bank. What Israel is threatening to annex is half of that, about 30%. That is where our land is, of course. That is where our water resources are. That is where our, our stone and marble quarries are. Stone and marble is the highest value industry in Palestine. And Israel basically is about to take what they haven't already took in terms of the quarries that produce that stone and marble. On the security side of things, which uh, is already in progress, the Palestinian-Israeli security cooperation has already collapsed, which means 
We're going to find more and more human rights abuses because there will not be a Palestinian involved in the security apparatus. And not that they were in a big extent, but at least there were some presence of them. Uh, this is all in progress. And the Palestinian side has already collapsed the U.S. relationship. Uh, there was one final channel open with the U.S. I think it was through the CIA, and that was closed. At least that's what they say. So scenarios moving forward, assuming some form of annexation happens. I think there'll be tons of condemnations. We're used to that. Little action. We're used to that as well. And ultimately, the slow process of Palestinians continuing their very long and hard struggle for freedom and independence will continue politically, diplomatically, economically. We, we may see more nonviolent resistance on the ground, even though there's a lot of that that happens uh, without being reported. And maybe more importantly, we're going to find from a political perspective, more countries coming forward and recognizing the state of Palestine bilaterally. Remember, almost 140 countries or more maybe around the world have already bilaterally recognized Palestine, at least on paper. And that gives a clear message to the Israeli side saying to them, where are you going? There is an end game that the international community has already defined. And a state of Palestine is part of that end game. So the more countries that come forward, specifically in the EU, that recognize the state of Palestine, the more this annexation would have woke people up to actually walk the walk that they've been talking for the last 40, 50 years, which is a two-state solution. I actually think another potential moving forward is third-party mediation will come forward. The Palestinians have already said they will not accept US mediation anymore exclusively. Uh, they have opened a conversation with the quartet which is the EU, Russia, the US, and the UN. And there's talk about holding some kind of international conference or venue to be able to move this forward in a collective manner. Also, we can find Jordan and Egypt and the EU uh, pressuring Israel not to annex, at least not now, in their opinion. Uh, but Jordan has been adamantly clear. The king got online with congressmen and senators and basically said, there will be significant ramifications if this goes forward, including uh, he threatened the future of the Jordanian-Israeli peace agreement. Uh, so that there's, there's, there's a serious price to pay here for Israel if it goes forward. There could be, but I have it down on the list here because I don't think we're going to see it uh, as much as people maybe are expecting, full-scale civil disobedience. And once that happens, uh, think Intifada, whether the first one or the second one, no one can actually ensure today, especially not the weak Palestinian leadership that's in place, that this will remain nonviolent. So that can be a dangerous uh, step forward. We could also find a US reversal. Uh, November elections can come around and Biden might change the track of things. I don't think he will. Uh, what he's already said, he's cautioned about annexation, uh, but only cautioned. He hasn't made a very clear statement that it is an illegal act. Uh, but even so, if he came forward and wanted to make a change, Congress, thanks to the APAC, the pro-Israeli lobby in the U.S., has basically cornered is U.S. into a, has cornered the U.S. into a corner, um, or legislated the U.S. in a corner. So there there are legislation on the books which basically tie the hands of the executive branch to be able to do what it needs to do in this foreign affairs issue mainly because it's been converted to a domestic affairs issue uh, by efforts of that lobby. And then lastly, uh, we can see an Israeli reversal. This is highly unlikely, even though I think more and more as I'm hearing the replies coming from the different corners of the world, uh, including inside Israel, uh, that the powers to be in Israel may be rethinking this whole act of annexation or at least the pace of annexation because they have come to the conclusion, I think, that they see that there's going to be a huge price to pay. And I put a note here at the end, Bibi, which is Benjamin Netanyahu's nickname, Bibi's bark is always louder than his bite. He is a PR whiz. He gets up and makes grand statements. But when he's in his office, he knows the very delicate calculation on the ground. And I think uh, that will have a lot to play on terms of how he rolls out the annexation. Again, remember, 
he's only rolling out another version of annexation. So for him to do it fast or slow is just trying to optimize the presence of Trump. But with Trump or without Trump, Israel's on that track of annexation. I don't think they're gonna get off it until they're pressured to do so. So how is the world responding to this? Very briefly, top left, today I got this, 1,080 parliamentarians from 25 European countries have spoken out with a letter to the Israeli leaders saying, this is wrong, stop it, don't do it. Bottom left, 300 Israeli commanders and security specialists. These are the people who are responsible for Israel's security, have issued a statement basically saying, this is a threat to Israel's security. So although the reasons they may be against annexation may be different than mine, uh, because some of these security people were responsible for past rounds of annexation, uh, everyone has concluded that today in 2020, annexation will be a, a turning point that we can't go back after this is uh, reached. Uh, in the middle here, we have the EU making a very bold statement that there will be significant consequences uh, a couple weeks ago, the EU, for the first time ever, brought up in their discussions the issue of sanctioning Israel, which is a taboo in the world. Today, it's no longer a taboo. Today, once the language starts talking about sanctions, uh, we can start to imagine sanctions happening in the future. Top right, Churches for Middle East Peace. Uh, you have 27 national church organizations that actually spoke out against this. They wrote to Congress. And the bottom today, you have the uh, Secretary General of the UN basically saying there will be this is a serious violation of international law, and he's worried significantly that uh, this will change the entire chemistry of how this conflict is dealt with. In light of these responses, what's the Israeli government position? Well, you have the Israeli Defense Minister yesterday saying, and I quote, Israel won't keep waiting for the Palestinians. So I posted this yesterday on Facebook and I translated it. That's basically saying, hey, Palestinians, do you accept being ethnically cleansed? And I wanna help Gantz here save time. And I said, no. So the wait is over. It's not an issue of let's come discuss annexation. That would be like coming to discuss your own funeral. Uh, it's not gonna happen. And I wanna end just by a couple of slides to take things back to the bigger perspective. Because all of these things that I've spoken about lead to the same conversation at the end of the day. Whether it's annexation, Israel, Oslo Accords, the deal of the century, Gaza, peace to prosperity, the vision that Trump proposed, all of these issues come to a couple key factors that I think will help us think this through. First, what world order side are you on in 2020? Each and every one of us have to answer this question. The world reset after World War II for reasons that we all know. Pre-World pre War II, there was absolute chaos. Post-World War II, it is a rules-based world. It is not perfect. As you can see, the boxes on the right are not perfectly colored, and the lines are not perfectly straight. But it's definitely a rules-based world and what is right and what is wrong is defined collectively and states must abide to that to be able to remain in the community of nations. So this is the first question we have to kind of ask ourselves. If you are on the chaos side, the chaos ethos is basically accepting that God was a real estate agent. He worked for Century 21 or Remax or somebody else and he can distribute land to people and not to others. I don't believe that's the fact. My reading of my faith and uh, of others' faiths is not that uh, it is a transactional uh, kind of arrangement. And that's a discussion that we can have. The rules-based ethos is something else. It is the Charter of the United Nations, which I started with. It's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it is the International Court of Justice. These three items are the pillars of a rules-based world. Add to that the chair of the, of, the, of the stool, and you have UN resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, Security Council resolutions, conventions, treaties. All of these together is what allows the world to tick. And we can either accept these with their flaws and try to make them better, 
or we can dismiss these and go to a chaos-based world, one that I really don't know how to operate in. And I want to bring up two documents that are foundational documents. The one on the left is the Palestinian Declaration of Independence, an excerpt from it. The one on the right is the, an excerpt from the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Not to read these, but I just want to make note. Both of them have embedded within them a mention of chaos, the chaos period, and the mention of a rules-based period. In a way, the Palestinians and the Israelis left all options open. That's not positive in my opinion. And I think we need to be able to pressure both sides to make sure they remain focused on a rules-based world. Because if they go back to their chaos-based reference, then we're never going to end this conflict and many more lives will be lost. As I noted, and it's important enough that I wanted to put it up on a slide by itself, the Palestinian side, at the end of the Oslo process, it didn't resolve the conflict, so the Palestinians went back to the UN, where this started, and basically stood in front of the General Assembly with its own resolution, turned out to be Resolution 67 over 19, and basically asked the world, world, we failed to resolve this conflict in a bilateral manner with the Israelis. So we ask you, is Palestine worthy of statehood or not? And on the right, you'll see 138 countries said yes, 41 abstained, and nine said no. Canada, Israel, Micronesia, Palau, the US, the Czech Republic, Marshall Islands, Nauru, and Panama. Four of those are Pacific Islands that can probably fit on this screen. But the Palestinians basically came forward and said, not only did we recognize the state of Israel in the beginning of the Oslo process, but we've gone one step further and we've asked you to recognize the state of Palestine in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. Israel missed a historic opportunity to embrace this and come forward and negotiate the last remaining border between Israel and Palestine. And the two maps here on the left-hand side is what that Resolution 181, which was the partition plan of 1947, it was a general assembly resolution, so it was not a binding resolution, but both countries referred to it in their Declaration of Independence, so that's why I mention it here. That was the map. Israel went far beyond that map, by force, of course. Um, and remember, uh, the Charter of the United Nations was in 1945, before Israel was even created. On the right-hand side, you have what the international community has identified as Israel and what it has identified as occupied territory, uh, being the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. I need to note here that Israel has never, ever accepted that those are occupied territories. They tell our Western ears many different things. They like to tell us that they have been disputed territories or administered territories or territories under negotiation but 700 UN resolutions have called it what it is, which is a military occupied area, which needs to find that occupation to end soon. So I, I, I say this because diplomatically, the state of Palestine exists today in the UN. We are a non-member observer state, just like the Holy See is a non-member observer state. Um, we have all the tools available to us that are available to states. And Israel today is a state in the UN. And when I say revoke the recognition of Israel, that's a political act. But diplomatically, Israel sits at the UN just like we do. Uh, so both of the states exist on paper. We need to make sure both are existing and free on the ground. And the last set of maps here I have are Trump's vision for peace, the peace to prosperity plan. On the left-hand side is Trump's grand plan for how the state of Israel will look. It will be the, uh, the dark brown part. Uh, and you'll see that Israel is uh, not only the dark brown part on the left-hand side, but also the brown dots that are inside the green areas. Those are, those are settlements that Israel will claim to be theirs, as well as the entire Jordan Valley. No wonder some Israelis are saying this doesn't work, including settlers. Uh, even though they have an illegal presence, they definitely don't want to be surrounded by Palestinians and then be 
a Palestinian state to be claimed. Um, and that's the, uh, the state of Israel on the left. On the right is the envisioned state of Palestine. It's not a state at all. It's an archipelago of different Bantu stands separated by brown areas, which means Israel has all the continuity connections. Um, and of course, this is a, a, not a viable state, but more importantly, not only does it not smell like a state or taste like a state or look like a state, internationally, it is not what the international bodies have defined as the state of Palestine. And whether you're Trump or you're uh, Arthur Belfour from the Brit British time, uh, you can't just sit in your office in the White House and give pieces of land which are not yours to people, other peoples. Um, that just doesn't work today. Uh, and I don't think it worked that time in the Belfort era as well, as we can see, we're still struggling that struggle today. So to end, as again, again, this is not new for us. And uh, I, I put this post out a couple of weeks ago. Why can't we just as Palestinians be Palestinians in Palestine and be left alone? Why do I say that? Dov Weisglass is uh, was a, is an Israeli lawyer, business guy. He was an advisor to Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. And he once said that uh, we educated the world to understand there is no one to talk to. And we received a no one to talk to certificate. It worked. We convinced the world the Palestinians basically don't exist to talk to. That certificate, he says, will be revoked only when this and this happens. When Palestinians become, when Palestine becomes Finland. More recently, the US ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, said when he was talking to a group of settlers who were mad because they thought a Palestinian state might be announced, even if it's not a real state. And he said, you don't have to live with a Palestinian state. You have to live with the Palestinian state when the Palestinians become Canadians. And I end my talk by showing this slide to answer these two gentlemen by telling them these beautiful children of Gaza are not gonna become Finland and are not gonna become Canada anytime soon. Thank you. Well, Sam, uh, uh, thank you for this analysis. Uh, you gave us a lot to, uh, I see some people applauding. So uh, thank you, thank you for this. I want everybody to know that we have, uh, we're recording this and uh, this uh, interview will be made available. Sam's presentation, we have permission from him uh, to record it and it'll be available on our YouTube channel and we'll be making it available to all of you. So Sam, uh, I have a number of questions. We've had a number of questions uh, that were raised during your talk. Um, let, me, um, let me go to the one uh, that was right up front from our friend, uh, um, uh, Mark Braverman, who wants to ask you about the uh, one state solution. I mean, a lot of folks say that this just makes, in reality, what's been de facto all along the one, one state. Uh, so moving forward, what do you think about the movement to one state? We interviewed here Jeff Halper and Awad Abdel Fattah uh, a, a number of weeks ago. Uh, the one democratic state is originating from 48 Israel. What's your sense of that from a West Bank perspective? And are you aware of the connection of the One Democratic State campaign with any parties in the West Bank? So that's from Mark Braverman. You're muted, Sam. Thank you, Mark. It's great to have you online. Um, good question. We get it all the time. Couple of things to note here. Yes, I'm aware of the one state movement. It's a, a fledging movement and it's growing. And the more you have a loss of a generation seeing that there's a potential for a solution through a two state solution, you're gonna find more people adopting that. However, I continue to commit myself to a two state solution, not because I think it's the best solution in the world, but I understand that to be a, uh, an act of political capital that has already been spent by the Palestinians. And I know that the international community likes to discuss one state, two state, you know, what do you think is better? Is there a three state solution? Well, there's actually much more. There's actually parallel sovereignty, there's confederation, there's federation. I don't know why they call it political science. They should have called it political art. The, 
bottom line is that the Palestinians spent capital way back when, actually from 1988, and if not before, uh, by stating that they have envisioned their self-determination to be realized via statehood. And that's why we took the issue of statehood to the UN, and it is gaining traction. Uh, getting 138 countries to say yes to Palestine formally is not a light effort. And I wouldn't want to throw that away because there's a madman in the White House or because there's a right-wing Israeli government that's about to take another step of annexation. I would claim today that the discussion of one state and two state is beyond us. Today, a state of Palestine exists in the international community. All that is remaining is a military occupation that needs to be removed from that state. I say that knowing how hard what I'm saying is about to become, especially if another round of annexation happens. But I also say that knowing that the body that will make a decision otherwise is not a webinar and it's not the international community. It is the Palestinian political agency. So if the Palestinian political agency comes together, and today that's a weak agency, but it's an agency nonetheless, if the Palestinians come together and decide amongst themselves that they no longer want to pursue statehood and they want to convert this to a one state, a civil rights movement, that is our right to do. Uh, I don't think that will happen anytime soon. And I think the one state approach today is a red herring. We should be talking about two things, rights on the ground. Whether you're a one-stater or a two-stater or something else, we can all agree that our rights are not linked to some kind of political configuration in the future. Secondly, we should respect the Palestinian agency's desire for statehood and call on our states to recognize the state of Palestine, to stop the net, that as, as one means of stopping the next annexation, and not allow Netanyahu and company to change the discussion, to make it about annexation or no annexation. That's not the discussion. The core discussion is get the Israeli boot off of our neck, exit the state of Palestine so a two-state solution can materialize on the ground as it has already materialized in the diplomatic world as I showed in my presentation. Sam, Don Wagner, thanks. For, Don Wagner has a follow-up. Uh, says we in the US are advised to avoid one state versus two states and say it's up to the Palestinians. In the interim, we don't know what the Palestinians want, but like your strategy of supporting Palestine is a state. Is that the position we should take during this interim period? I believe, it is. I believe it is, hi Don. I believe it is. And I think there is a unifying platform that we can all agree on as I noted, which is rights. We're in a right-based discussion, and the U.S. today is in a, a mode of uh, a civil rights movement, again, which allows all this to come home. Uh, we're talking about Palestinian rights today. We should not be facing movement and access restrictions, house demolitions, arbitrary arrests, child arrests. All of these issues are issues that are really unrelated to a one-state or two-state issue, and we can rally around states, uh, around rights. Some of these rights are being violated not only in Palestine, but have been exported to the US. The, the, the conversation on Palestine-Israel has been increasingly closed down by states. They are passing legislation to make it illegal, for example, to boycott Israeli products because they're seeing that there is a groundswell over the last decade in the US of a new generation of American leaders and American youth, even Jewish American youth, saying occupation has to end, period. And they're willing to talk about ending the occupation and realizing the fact that Palestinian rights are being abused and the US is supporting all of that. That is something very different than the end game, being a two-state solution or otherwise, which will be a long time in coming. We're far away from an end game but the violation of rights is here and now and needs to be addressed here and now. What are you hearing about um, the reaction of, from the Palestinian government and also Palestinian civil society? Uh, you, mentioned boy, uh, uh, you mentioned some sanctions. 
uh, from the uh, uh, global community. You also mentioned something about the resistance movements that may not all be nonviolent. I've often thought that maybe after this annexation, it might lead to a third intifada. You implied that. So just various levels of society, their reactions once this annexation is uh, uh, goes forward. From the government level and the PLO level, they've already acted. As I noted, they took the, uh, the coalition government in Israel, they're coming together and signing that annexation is part of their political platform as the indication that annexation has already started politically. So the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is the overriding body, finally, finally, because it was a long time coming, basically absolved itself from all of the agreements of Oslo because Israel has torn those up multiple times and the annexation was kind of the last nail in the coffin. So from a, 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 an official dome level, they finally came around to their senses to say, we are no longer playing this game called peace process while Israel is allowed to continue to create facts on the ground. From the civil society level, there is a lot of activity going on uh, rallying against the annexation, but it's being done in a pace which clearly indicates that most Palestinian organizations see this as, I noted, yet another round of annexation and part of a whole uh, puzzle of occupation, discrimination uh, that Israel has been adopting over time. So organizations are already on the ground working for decades now, have another task, which is to clarify to the world that this act of annexation doesn't change much reality on the ground, but it should wake people enough to finally see what we've seen for a very long time, which is Israel has no intention whatsoever to end this occupation, let alone to allow a Palestinian state to emerge. So if, if this annexation has done anything, it has woken people up. And I don't think uh, the cat could be put back in the box, even if uh, the annexation uh, next month doesn't happen. The, the sheer threat of annexation and the adopting it as a political program of a government has been enough to tell the EU to start talking about sanctions. And the Palestinian civil society will be optimizing that revealing of the Israeli position in a very big way. On the ground level, you're having multiple crises at once. Not only has there been an ongoing occupation which has taken its toll, uh, but you have, in addition to that, the COVID crisis and now the annexation crisis. And through all of that, the last four years, we've had Trump basically defunding everything in Palestine, taking unilateral steps with Israel, like moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, cutting off funding to the refugee agency called UNRWA, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those together, and COVID kind of like was the icing on the cake, have put people back into a very serious survival mode. In a normal situation without COVID, about now, Palestinians would be in the street. I don't know if we can call it an intifada or not, but that's the traditional way Palestinians express their anger and frustration. COVID has kind of limited the ability for us to do that. If annexation does go through this time again, I actually think people will break the COVID uh, restrictions here and go out. Um, again, what form and shape that takes is up for all of us to see. But remember, uh, this is not a chapter that has just emerged. This is a 40, 50, 60 year struggle uh, that has uh, created some fatigue in our society as well. We are not super people. Uh, we have to go to work, make a living, uh, fight this occupation to end, as well as start building a state. That's a lot for one people to try to deal with at the same time. Any, um, yeah, I hear you. A any, uh, um, any significant partners within Israel? I mean, the Israeli left, uh, you know, I, I go hot and cold in terms of how effective or how, how uh, what kind of a critical mass they are. But tell us about partners within Israel itself. Either mainstream, in government or civil society. The mainstream political left in Israel, you'll need a microscope to find it today in Israel. What we're finding instead, one of our main partners in Israel is the Palestinian citizens of Israel, Muslims and Christians, 
who make up 2 million people, 20% almost of the Israeli population, and is the third largest block in the Knesset. So basically, that block is ignored by all other Israeli Jewish parties. If Gantz would not have ignored that bloc, uh, he could have had a government without Netanyahu. But the Muslims and Christians inside Israel are dismissed as if they don't exist. However, they are a growing, growing political power inside of Israel, and they're rocking the boat inside the Israeli political system. So that's our first ally. We also have uh, groupings of young Jewish Israelis uh, that I think are worthy of noting. Everything from breaking the silence, combat, Israeli combat soldiers who are sent to do the work of the occupation and are shocked at what they find and come back to the Israeli society and speak out against what they found. Uh, Israel actually uh, has moved to block them from entering Israeli schools. So children can't hear the bad side about the occupation, which is all of the occupation. Uh, you have other pockets within Israel, um, various uh, shades uh, who are rallying around the issue of ending the occupation. Interesting, the public at large in Israel, of course, it has shifted right during the last two decades when Netanyahu has been in power. But the, the polling shows that the majority of Israelis want the occupation to end if they accept it as an occupation but they don't know what the solution is because they can't trust a solution in their own mind. Uh, and they, they have a dilemma, basically. They don't want to be occupiers, or at least they don't want to be shunned away in the world as uh, a, a rogue state, because that's where they're heading. Uh, they don't want to be boycotted in the global community. They want to be part of the global community. And the more uh, cost that we can apply on the state of Israel, because it continues this occupation, the better chance that we have that more Israelis will wake up to the reality that they need to work in their own governmental context to get policies in place to change this uh, so Israel can leave the occupied territory and allow Palestine to come to fruition. Um, some people, I mean, Jeff Halper, a good friend of mine who was uh, on your call the other day, uh, we always have this debate, him and I. Uh, I tell him that there's a need to be able to work with constituencies inside the state of Israel to make sure that they are aware that they have a role to play. And Jeff tries to convince me that it's a lost cause. The only way Israel is going to feel the heat of being an occupier is if it, that heat comes from external sources. Um, I actually think it's both. The external pressure has to happen, but the internal pressure has to happen as well. You mentioned the uh, quartet. Um, maybe I missed that. I, I didn't hear you say anything about the International Criminal uh, Court. What, what about the ICC? When Palestine was upgraded in the United Nations to a, a non-member observer state in 2012, a new toolbox was presented to us because as a non-member observer state, you have a, a lot of the tools that states have. One of those tools is that we have the ability to bring uh, Israel to justice through the International Criminal Court. And we did that. We have applied for membership, we received membership in the court, and we have now applied cases that we're trying to adjudicate in the court. Uh, that is something that's driving Israel up a wall. It's actually driving the U.S. up a wall as well. Um, Israel and the U.S. are the only two parties in the world, I think, who are not accepting the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. They actually want to punish the International Criminal Court for even thinking about holding Israel accountable. You may have heard Trump the other day pass uh, some kind of decree uh, calling for uh, blocking uh, staff of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and their children uh, and family members if they want to come to the US. So this is a, a, a heavy-handed punishment mechanism trying to get those who are responsible for keeping that rules-based world order intact uh, uh, enabled to do their work. That's not going to work. The global community is rallied around a rules-based world, whether it's the WTO, WTO in trade or the ICC for criminal acts or otherwise. And us being upgraded in the UN as a state actually allows us to bring all the pieces of this occupation in front of the different world bodies, whether it's about telecom or environment or water 
or agriculture. All of these are dealt with in international bodies and we bring cases to those bodies so Israel can be exposed for what Jeff Halper calls the matrix of occupation that they have created around us. Um, I, you referred to it and of course, uh, this is consuming the world. Uh, uh, I wanna talk with you about the COVID uh, virus right now. Uh, originally, uh, Palestinian government and Israel uh, too, uh, took some really very successful, largely measures to stem the to stem the spread of the COVID virus in Israel and in the West Bank. But we've heard that recently, uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's been a spiking of cases now that the restrictions have started to lift. So talk about the COVID situation in Israel and Palestine. And uh, you've referred to it too, and how the the pandemic has uh, uh, provided cover for the annexation plans and the continuing occupation. Sure. Uh, the Palestinian government actually took early steps very early on in closing down society. Uh, they were probably one of the first governments in the world to actually close schools and uh, churches and mosques and so forth. So that helped a lot in making sure that it did not expand uh, rapidly knowing very well that we have a, a very difficult healthcare system in terms of capacity. The fear was that if this outbreaks in Gaza, which is one of the most dense places in the world, if not the most, there will be a catastrophic result. So luckily everything was closed down. Um, of course, you can only close down people for so long. So after I think it was uh, four or five weeks, they've actually allowed people to start to go out with uh, social, you know, physical distance and masks and so forth. That worked for a period of time. People got a little bit lazy, especially when graduation season came around and wedding season came around. And, and that created a little bit of uh, exposure that wasn't uh, expected. One of the biggest clusters of people that are uh, a, a, a high risk one here are the 120,000 Palestinian workers in the West Bank that go to Israel to work every day, and they come back into their societies. Israel has a much higher exposure rate of cases, um, and those workers are not getting checked properly inside the state of Israel, so a lot of them would come back and you know, mingle in their villages, and that would cause uh, outbreak as well. So like everywhere else, we're dealing with how to keep society open at the same time uh, to allow the economy to move forward because people have to be able to work. Um, you know, Trump might be able to send out a $1,200 check to everybody. This government doesn't have the resources to do that. So ultimately, people need to get back to work. And it's a, it's a, a, a seesaw right now of, of what we do to be able to balance. Uh, but everybody's worried like everywhere else. And this annexation, for sure, the COVID is providing a cover because Israel is working very hard every day to not only do the annexation, but to do everything they always do, uh, including killing somebody yesterday, uh, as is a regular issue these days of people getting shot in the street. Um, so all of this is happening under the cover of COVID. And the fear is that an act of annexation will emotionally move people to the point where they just dismiss the issue of COVID and, and go out and that can create an entire new reality that you know could be very dangerous for cases to be uh, shared even further. Our longtime friend uh, and activist uh, Pauline Kaufman uh, has this question. Is it up on the screen for you, Sam? No, I don't see it. Uh, uh, everyone describes the PA as weak, yet they handled COVID well. Is it possible for the PA to be strong? Are the constrictions imposed upon the PA uh, part of the problem. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, the government here, did deal with COVID in a, a way that wasn't expected. Um, they acted uh, swiftly uh, and with uh, proper kind of mechanisms in place to follow up and communicate. Probably the most important thing they did was communicate with people on a regular basis of what COVID is, what can be done about it, not to exaggerate it, but to take it serious as well. They were communicating almost every single day through press conferences. And I think people respected that because historically, 
the Palestinian government and the Palestinian leadership of the PLO have not been very communicative with people. And given that they are a non-representative body, because they didn't come to power through elections, uh, the, the need to be able to communicate is key. So that was seen during the COVID crisis uh, and was respected. Overall, the Palestinian Authority is a function of uh, what Israel will allow it to do. So we shouldn't exaggerate the Palestinian government as being something all encompassing of a real government. It's not. It is taking care of the people under occupation as much as the Israelis allow them to do that, including transferring 60% of its budget, which comes from custom fees that Israel collects at its ports and, and, and uh, inside Israel, uh, that's our money. Uh, and many times Israel doesn't send us our money. So 60% of the budget of the Palestinian Authority is basically uh, at the beck and call of a faucet that Israel controls. So the government is, uh, is weak partly because Israel makes it weak and partly because of its non-representative uh, orientation. Having said that, the focal point these days is on the Palestine Liberation Organization. That is the encompassing body of all Palestinians. And that is where the buck stops in the Palestinian political system. And that's where people are looking for reform. At the end of the day, if the PLO decides that the Palestinian Authority should take a different shape or form or even be dismantled, that's a Palestinian Liberation Organization decision. And that's where the focus needs to be. A lot of times after Oslo, all the focus went to the Palestinian Authority, the government, the day-to-day -day government. Uh, but politically, that's not really where the cards are kept. The cards are kept at the Palestine Liberation Organization. That's the organization that actually entered into the Oslo process. And that's the organization last month that absolved itself from that process. About three years ago, uh, um, when I was in Ramallah with one of our groups uh, and visiting with you, you gave me your absentee ballot to deliver and uh, mail uh, for you upon return to the U.S., which I faithfully did. I just want to pass that along. Uh, Donald Trump has been a disaster um, for Palestinians and for us here. But Joe Biden, as you pointed out, his political history hasn't has been one of absolutist support for the state of Israel. And he's very tepidly come out against annexation, but who knows if that has any teeth in it. Uh, is there any hope for Palestinians uh, it, within the U.S.? Um, what can we do as citizens here to hold our government to their feet to the fire? Because you uh, uh, have a stake in that as well as an American citizen. Absolutely. Um, the first thing I would note is Trump is a disaster in all the discussions that we can have. But we shouldn't place the entire burden of this conflict on Trump's lap. It is the US that has been on the wrong side of this conflict from day one. It is successive US governments, Democrat and Republican, which have been on the wrong side of this conflict in Congress and in the executive branch. And the responsibility has to go back to the American people to pressure their representatives to change policy. And that is a long battle to do, but it's not one that we're starting from scratch. Actually, I think we've made great strides and Trump, if anything, has helped us expose how lopsided the US is in terms of this conflict and how adoptive to a right-wing Israeli policy that his administration has become to reveal that we're on the wrong, as America, we are on the wrong side. Uh, that will change. The younger generation is already articulating in different ways, whether it's uh, individual congressmen and senators who have spoken out um, uh, against uh, this pro-Israeli lobby, which I think has taken uh, the US Congress uh, uh, and hijacked it. Actually, there's two Israeli controlled territories in the world. One is here and one is in Washington, DC. And it's uh, until the US can start articulating I wanna say a fair-handed policy, but I would also say an internationally law embedded policy. I'm not asking the US to take the Palestinian side. I'm asking the US to remain committed, if it ever was, to a rules-based world. So if a rules-based world is applied, 
You don't need 43 U US vetoes. The global community has spoken over and over again, and it knows that Israel can and should be held accountable in order for it to stop what it's doing. It is only the US that has allowed this to continue. So from a US perspective, actually the front line of this conflict, I believe, is in every US city, not here. Uh, the front line of this conflict is in Washington and Indiana and in Chicago and in California. And with what's happening now with the civil uprising in the US, there is a lot of intersectionality that can be spoken about. I know people are overwhelmed with COVID and overwhelmed with the police issue and so forth. Uh, it will phase out over time and come back to a long-term format. And in that long-term mobilizing format, Palestine work will be part and parcel of that discussion. I sit on the board, actually, before this meeting, I just came from a three-hour board meeting with an organization called Just Vision, which is based out of Washington. And we do documentaries. You may have seen uh, the last one we did was Na'ala and the Uprising or Budros. Um, these movies talk about Israeli and Palestinian uh, human rights defenders. And we're working on our first film aimed for the US audience about how free speech in the US is being closed down based on the Palestinian issue rising up in universities and in churches and in uh, political en environments. States are actually legislating to close that discussion down. So we're bringing a documentary to tell the American citizen basically, listen, this may be coming through you, to you through uh, the Palestinian issue. But what is happening is your rights as American citizens are being cut because this pro-Israeli lobby is trying to close down a specific discussion today about Palestine, but tomorrow it'll be about other things which are close to home. So one way Americans can help is supporting this effort of creating this documentary, which will, I assume, uh, uh, be very broadly viewed. But again, I'm a strong believer that uh, all global politics starts local. And whether we're talking about mobilizing in our churches, we cannot go to church every Sunday and sing about Bethlehem and not realize that Bethlehem has a wall around it and Bethlehem Christians can't get to Jerusalem. That's part and parcel of today's discussion in the church community, it should be. And that means annexation needs to be spoken out against as well. Um, or within our uh, political atmosphere. We need to be in the face of our legislators. We cannot let them continue to take $5,000 and $10,000 from a pro-Israeli lobby to be able to buy their vote when he knows or she knows very well that it is outside of the strategic interest of the U.S. to remain on the wrong side of history in this conflict. So don't take the Palestinian side. At, at worst, take a neutral side. And if you want to do the right thing, stand for ending the Israeli occupation. And those legislators need to be told that point blank. And I'm not holding my breath, to be honest with you. In the free South Africa movement, the US was the last to come around to its senses to stand up against apartheid. I would hope that there's more knowledge today in the US communities to not make the US the last of those nine that voted against the Palestinians to have a state um, and that the US would come around to its senses sooner rather than later. I'm aware of the time, Sam, uh, but I wanna uh, have you respond to, uh, um, you, you mentioned intersectionality. Uh, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement is, uh, uh, we're, we're very supportive of Black Lives Matter movement here in the US, uh, uh, at least those of us who are activists uh, talk about, uh, and of course, that raises the issue of the militarization of police here in this country. And that raises the issue of the Israeli military training of our of our security forces and police forces here. Say a word about uh, 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 those intersectional relationships right. in the West Bank and how uh, you're finding support for the Black Lives Movement there and those connections that are being made where you live. The, the relationship between the Black community in the US and the Palestinian struggle for freedom and independence is a long-standing one. It didn't appear uh, because of the murder of George Floyd. It's been in, in place and being developed for a very long time. I just put in the chat here, 
an article that I wrote, trying to uh, pass on some lessons of the Palestinian struggle for freedom and independence to the movement in the States today. I think the movement in the States needs to be broader than what it is today. It's not only about police brutality. That's an issue that needs to be dealt with. But there's a momentum happening in the US that needs to package a different uh, uh, social contract between Americans. And that social contract, like you noted, is everything from the militarization of society to the justice system, to the economic inequalities, et cetera, et cetera. And that needs to be packaged. That also needs to be led. And I pass on a message to my friends in the US who are active today in this movement. Uh, unity is key. We know that we paid a big price for our disunity. Don't let the secondary issues between you all to separate you from unifying around that new social contract that needs to be carved out uh, from people on the ground. Um, if that movement in the US remains confined to one specific issue, I believe that it will fizzle out. Uh, of course, progress will be made, but in a limited fashion. I think the moment now is to take this long-standing civil rights movement uh, that we're seeing a new episode of today and repackage it. It's kind of like Palestinians saying, don't focus too, too much on annexation, focus on the goal of ending the Israeli military occupation and getting them out of Palestine. Same thing in the US. Let's not focus totally on the police brutality and talk about true civil rights in the US in order to get out of the civil rights movement and to move to a different place. We don't wanna come back to a civil rights episode every year or two. And we don't wanna come back to another annexation episode every year or two. We are focused on nipping this illegal reality from the bud. And that's going to require a long-term vision, unity, and a social contract. Sam, I'm gonna let you have the last word, but before I do, I wanna just remind everyone that our next program is in two weeks, Thursday, July the 9th, this time at one o'clock, uh, Thursday, July 9th at one o'clock Eastern time, we'll be interviewing Sieglinde uh, Weinbrunner, the Lutheran World Federation representative in Jerusalem, who's trained as a nurse, and Waleed Namur, chief executive officer of the Augusta Victoria Hospital. Do you know uh, Waleed, Sam? Yes, I highly encourage you to listen to him if you can. He has a lot to say. So anyway, he's the CEO of the Augusta Victoria Hospital on the Mount of Olives, the sole specialized medical care center for folks in the West Bank and Gaza. We'll be discussing the Israeli annexation plans, the critical role Augusta Victoria has been playing during the COVID outbreak in, outbreak in Israel and the West Bank, straddling the PA and Israeli government to provide medical care and more during these difficult times. So that's Thursday, July the 9th, one o'clock Eastern time, and we'll be sending the word out uh, through our various uh, uh, various uh, means uh, to remind you about that interview. So Sam Bahor, uh, it's good to see you, man. Thanks for coming today. Uh, any parting words for us? I, I mean, speaking to the group, uh, for those of you who are in Fort Wayne, I don't have to tell you this is a long struggle and we need you to get engaged because you've been engaged for a very long time. I would say stay connected with us. Uh, you can do that through many different venues. I have a blog, which I post things that I think are worthy of seeing. It's epalestine.ps or .com. Um, so you can connect to me on social media through there. Um, also, if you're in the business community, the organization that Michael mentioned, the Americans for a Vibrant Palestinian Economy, uh, come forward. We can try to find out how we can cooperate in the business world because we don't want to romanticize about the Palestinians. We have to wake up and work and create a reality here that allows us to sustain this struggle. And part of that is an economic struggle as well. And again, if you're on the human rights side, uh, please help us with Just Vision to get this uh, uh, new movie, this new documentary about free speech in the US out. Um, and you can do that through justvision.org. Many other places you can go to, those are three. Um, I leave you with the words to relax a bit because rest assured, Palestinians are going nowhere. Another round of annexation or 10, we are still here, we will remain here. 
only the political configuration of the future will be reconfigured. But we are here and need your support to remain committed to this struggle until it ends so we can live as normal people like everyone else and receive you as visitors, not to come and see the occupation, but to come to see this beautiful land. Thank you, Sam. And I just want to assure you, we, uh, we are with you. We stand with you uh, strong, side by side, hand in hand. We've had, we do have people from Fort Wayne uh, here on this call today, but we also have activists, many of whom are your friends from coast to coast. And I see them on the screen before me. So I see a number of people applauding and nodding their heads and saying, thank you, uh, thank you. for all your work and for your bold witness. So Sam, thanks. We'll see you all again in two weeks for our interview with our, our friends at Augusta Victoria Hospital on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Thank you all for joining us today.